So our next speaker is Dr. Tim England. Um, his talk is entitled, Backyard Chickens, A Veterinary's Perspective. Dr. Tim England was born and raised in South Central Michigan. He has been passionate about birds since his early childhood. After graduating from MSU in 1989, he went on to found Crossroads Animal Hospital in Jackson, Michigan. In 2008, he sold his practice and joined the Animal Medical Center of Chicago. Throughout his career, he has advocated for the proper care, welfare, and conservation of all animals, but especially birds. Dr. Ringland has been involved in parrot conservation in the Caribbean, on the islands of Puerto Rico, and Dominica. Additionally, he received worldwide media coverage when he helped to create artificial legs for an amputee chicken. He joins us today speaking about how veterinarians can impact the care and welfare of that poultry. Without further ado, Dr. England. that ready for me to set up. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about me. Um, like Dr. Ryan said, I have been passionate about birds as long as I can remember. I can't ever remember not being excited about seeing a bird, talking about birds, and um, just living in a world where there are birds. So um, the um, um, most exciting thing for me is, again, talk, talking about birds, and I can do that for a really long time, so I um, would be happy to help anybody who ever has questions about birds in their world and birds that they see in practice. But I do know from a um, standpoint as far as in clinical practice that veterinarians in general are sometimes very intimidated about seeing birds. Is this better? Yeah. Uh, about seeing birds in practice, um, anything that doesn't um, nurse its young with milk is sometimes a little scary for people, and so um, I think as veterinarians, we in general have a great background in um, biosecurity and animal health, and just um, um, can make, have a big impact whether you are familiar with birds in general or have an interest in birds, but just don't be afraid to say, sure, I, I'm willing to help you out. Um, the other thing that I hope that you'll glean from today's talk is that um, this being Thanksgiving week, maybe you'll have some good facts to share with your friends about the Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> so, um, important things as far as how veterinarians can have an impact on the health and welfare of their patients is that, you know, who are our clients? And our clients range from people who are backyard hobbyists, they have one or two um, chickens that either they um, were at the feed store and, and fell in love with. Um, there are serious breeders, people who have a passion for birds, who um, travel around the country showing their, their birds, um, and probably have a huge background and knowledge base on the genetics as well as the health care of these birds. Um, but I think we can all, whether we are excited about birds or not necessarily excited about birds, can help these people as well learn to um, take better care and, and be um, impactful in the welfare management of their birds. Um, there are clients who have small meter egg farms. A lot of people are um, this, you know, interested in raising a few eggs, a few birds um, to slaughter, and those birds um, definitely get ill. Um, the management of them can certainly be a challenge for some of these farmers, and so we can be, uh, have an impact on that. And then pet keepers, um, there's a, um, a large segment of people who have one or two little hens in their backyard that's very trendy. And um, so um, birds are fun to have around. They have personalities and people enjoy them. And, and those are the uh, clients who are particular about probably being a lot more um, interested in doing advanced diagnostics and testing on their, um, their pets. And then finally, humane societies, just as long as we continue to see um, people being interested in having a few birds, um, eventually people tire of them, their kids go off to school or get interested in other things, and so they get dumped off at Humane Societies. And um, In Chicago, we have a relatively large um, backyard poultry um, uh, population, and as people 
tire of that um, task and hobby, they um, often want to dump them onto some of our humane organizations. And so they're saddled with these birds that um, potentially are uh, a problem as far as dealing with. So um, I'm not here to talk about commercial egg production. I'm not here to talk about commercial meat producers. There are uh, poultry pathologists and veterinarians who could certainly help these people. Uh, so who are our patients? Uh, the one thing that we always have to remember is that as much as we are emotionally attached to an individual chicken or individual bird, that these are food animals, and as a result, the FDA really requires that we take all the precautions that we would with any food producing animal uh, to be careful with what we're administering it and withdrawal times uh, for any of the drugs that we use. Um, Clients don't necessarily like that answer and don't necessarily understand that. And so you have to be very tactful and insightful in helping them to understand that uh, their, their beloved chicken is, is still governed by the same rules and regulations that we have to um, abide by for taking care of um, um, chickens that are, that are destined to be food or egg production. Uh, so, we talk about poultry. Um, the FDA regulations primarily apply to chickens and turkeys. Um, chickens um, are, are probably one of the most studied as far as nutritional needs of any species out there. They, um, uh, the foods and, and the diets available for them are, are quite extensively studied. And, um, you know, we have egg class chickens, so chickens that are designed primarily for producing eggs, and there are breeds of chickens and hybrids of chickens that are specific for that. And then meat class production, um, um, the birds that are actually destined to be market birds. Uh, and then same way with turkeys. Turkeys are generally meat production class. Um, there are breeding flocks of turkeys. These turkey poults that are sold and people are raising have to be raised somewhere. And so uh, there are large commercial flocks of birds that are raised specifically to produce those eggs that go on to produce the um, um, turkeys that are raising our Thanksgiving tables this week. So. Uh, and then there are minor species of, of poultry as well that we see. So um, everything from domestic species of ducks and geese um, to exotic species of ducks and geese. There are um, breeders and, and collectors who have an extensive collections of, of wild species of, of ducks and geese, as well as pheasants, uh, peafowl. Uh, guinea fowl certainly fall into the class of semi-domesticated species that people often keep. Uh, whales and partridges. And although um, pigeons are not truly really poultry, people who have um, pigeons often have other species as well. And there are a significant number of diseases that will uh, also affect poultry um, that, that pigeons can get. They get their own uh, class of, of viruses and bacteria. So. Uh, so the one thing, if you're going to see a pet bird or someone's pet chicken or have a small producer who wants to, um, you know, um, look to you for some services, you, you kind of got to know a little bit about the terminology or you're not going to have a lot of credibility going in. So. Um, I thought I'd just kind of walk you through some of the things, what they mean, so that you can, you can actually speak to these people on an intelligent level. Um, so chickens, um, there's roosters, um, are um, basically a, a male chicken that's above a year of age. A uh, cock is the same as a rooster. A cockerel is a rooster less than one year of age. The same dynamic holds for uh, female chickens. So a hen is a... Um, an adult when she begins to lay eggs, um, also called a layer, and a pullet is a um, cat is a chicken who is less than one year of age. She may be laying eggs, but she's in the first year of her life. Uh, poultry keepers also are, are interested in having different versions of everything. So um, in chickens, there are bantam breeds and standard breeds. Um, for every standard breed of chicken, basically, there's a miniature version of it. Uh, there are some miniature versions of, ch of chicken breeds that are um, specific and only bantam or small breeds. Um, and so um, knowing what a bantam is, is is a good thing to know if you're going to be seeing chickens. And then um, the different classes of chickens that are produced for meat production. So a broiler or a fryer or basically a, a meat class bird that's typically around um, eight weeks of age or younger. Um, roaster chickens are chickens that are grown out a little bit longer, so they're a little bit bigger, they have a little bit higher fat content. 
Uh, and then a Cornish hen uh, are not necessarily hens, they're not female chickens, they're just uh, the broilers or fryers that are, are slaughtered at an earlier age and typically around four weeks of age. Uh, one of the other terms that um, you may hear is broodiness, and uh, broodiness obviously only occurs in female chickens because they want to, um, that is that is term to determine that she wants to sit on her eggs. Um, chickens will lay basically an egg every 24 to 28 hours. Uh, if she gets enough eggs underneath her, or the, if they're not collected fast enough, they will get broody in order to sit on those eggs. Uh, and so sometimes um, uh, pet owners don't understand that they're, what their chicken is doing and they think they're ill because they're sitting in the nest box and won't come out. Um, turkeys, uh, basically, um, terminology, a top is a male turkey, a hen is a female turkey, a poult is a young um, turkey that is destined probably to be slaughtered, and then we have the differences between heritage breeds and commercial breeds. So a lot of the chicken, or turkeys that you're going to be eating this um, this weekend are um, commercial breeds of poultry. They're usually broad-breasted white turkeys. They have a nicer carcass. They look more appealing when they're roasted. Uh, but there is a big, um, I guess, wave of people who are producing heritage breed turkeys. Um, the, the nice advantage of these heritage breeds is they actually can um, self-reproduce. Um, so artificial insemination is not required for them to actually be reproductively active and, and produce chicks. Whereas, um, I would say, Every, every turkey that's available at most of the major grocery stores is going to be a result of artificial insemination. Um, through the same way, ducks, um, you've got a drake, a duck, and a duckling. For the geese, you've got a gander, a goose, and a gosling. And then we move on to some of the other uh, more uncommon uh, breeds or species that we tend to see. Uh, a squab is basically a young pigeon. Uh, and that's something that sometimes people will throw around or they'll have a, a pigeon breeder who has either racing birds or uh, hobby birds that they're showing and they'll be talking about problems with their squabs and, and it could be anything of a uh, pigeon that's up to weaning age. So um, when they asked me to talk, they asked to talk to me at a welfare conference. So I'm like, well, what do we talk about with welfare and poultry and people in the backyard? And so I really kind of had to think about what I wanted to really convey to you as far as making chickens lives better. Um, and so, first off, I looked up the definition of welfare, and I guess um, it's what everybody wants, which is to do well and have good fortune, happiness, and um, being prosperous and well-being. So, um, and so, some of the things that we're going to talk about is just meeting the needs for behaviorally what a chicken needs to live happily ever after, and to, um, if we do that, I, I think we certainly make the lives of the people who own those chickens a little bit better. Um, and I also think, and I firmly believe that we as veterinarians undervalue our uh, our knowledge base and our ability to convey uh, some basic understanding to our clients about how we can how we can improve the lives of the animals that they're living with. And we're intimidated that yeah, it's a bird. We don't really know anything about birds, but we really do know things about healthcare, health maintenance, biosecurity, and those are all things that we can use to help our clients um, um, be served better. All right, so one of the components of welfare is food, obviously, and like I said earlier, um, the nutritional needs for promoting growth and egg production are very well studied uh, because um, poultry is, the poultry industry is so huge, um, and, and that makes it nice for people who have a few backyard chickens that they have access to a variety of feeds that are available. Um, so first off, you obviously want to make sure that you have um, uh, a diet that's specific for the species that you're being kept. Um, turkeys require higher protein value than chickens. Young birds require um, higher protein values than, than older birds. Um, the calcium requirements for a hen that's producing an egg, um, you know, six days a week is um, certainly higher than that for a rooster that's running around and, and playing in someone's garden. Uh, then, so life stages, there are diets available for life stages of chicks just like there are um, for um, our dogs and cats. Um, we often see chick starter being labeled as medicated. Um, the thing that I guess you need to your take home message for that is medicated chick feed. Um, typically has amprolium in it, and that's as a coccidiostat. Uh, one of the major causes of, of death of, of young birds, especially in um, 
Um, situations where they're being raised where maybe the sanitation isn't as great as the coccidia, the coccidiosis um, has a, um, um, a major impact on mortality, mor morbidity of, of chicks that are in, in both backyard plots as well as the commercial industry. Um, so the second thing is water. Uh, so obviously access to clean water is essential for maintaining health of these birds. Water is, um, uh, in, in Michigan this time of year, something that's sometimes available um, that is, is frozen. And so giving clients an idea of, of how to maintain um, water access as well as, uh, you know, chickens are messy. They poop everywhere, there's feathers flying and things like that. So uh, giving them some options and some ideas as far as maintaining the sanitation and uh, reducing um, illness in their birds is a great thing to do. Uh, the nice thing is because the, of the boutique chick industry and the number of people that uh, have one or two chickens, they like to make their lives very, very happy and comfortable. And so um, there are now systems as complicated as the one at the bottom, which is a closed watering system with a heater. Uh, the chickens are actually trained to uh, pack up the little red um, um, outlets on the bottom and they can have a clean, warm source of water throughout the winter. Uh, and yeah, the, the water itself probably costs the, uh, more than you know 20 of the chickens that they own, but it certainly is a, a, a very good way to manage water um, that's clean and healthy and, and available to the birds year-round. Will the chickens buy the cord? Uh, they really don't. They're wrapped with wire, uh, probably to keep somebody from chewing on them. Not that chickens are going to chew them. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're curious about things like that, and they'll pick them, but the cord is... is is, is typically not a problem. Uh, so the next thing we have is shelter. Um, so because we live in Michigan, because these birds are kept in Michigan, we certainly have to um, protect them from the elements. Um, in the summertime it's hot, so uh, the scoop that I'm showing has a little vent um, ventilation system. It's got windows on the front and a, a roof back on the ridge to let air circulate. Uh, it has, it provides a nice clean warm place for the, the birds um, in the colder months. Um, chickens, most of the birds that we see are, are very cold hardy um, and they're pretty tolerant of cold weather. There are some species of some of the more rare and exotic um, pheasants that are from um, a little more temperature sensitive, but most of them, if you give them a place to get out of the cold and wind, they're, they're gonna do quite well. Um, and this, this scenario, um, these, these chickens are, you know, in and out, there's nest boxes, they are, are um, shaded um, direct on the south side by some um, trees in the, in the summertime, and, um, and it gives you a place to keep your chickens. Uh, the bigger thing is that um, everything wants to eat chickens. Chickens are delicious. Who doesn't want to eat chicken? Uh, and so there are multiple ways to try and not only prevent um, things from eating your chickens, but also your chickens from killing themselves. And I tell a lot of my clients and my friends um, that my job as a veterinarian a lot of times is to keep my, my patients from either killing themselves, because they always seem to find a way to try to do it, or something else from killing them. So um, I have um, clients and friends who have uh, everything from a dog who's been um, raised with the birds, so it is comfortable being around them and certainly keeps predators away. I have uh, a guy who has a large flock of free-range um, um, egg-producing chickens, and he has a flock of geese that actually roam around. Uh, and their flock of geese is, is, to be quite honest with you, very intimidating. Um, and they, they've really seen a reduction in uh, coyotes and raccoons and things from trying to bother his birds. Uh, there are really great systems involving electric fencing. Um, it certainly is, it does a great job of keeping um, predators out, especially at night, and it also keeps um, the chickens in, especially if you're moving. There's a really nice portable system. This is a, a, a solar um, um, electric fence charger with a portable electric fence that you can move around pretty readily. Um, so, in, in addition to the shelter, we definitely need to try and make some, um, make, make it a more habitable um, um, place for our, the chickens that are living with the flock. And so one of the things that we definitely like to advocate is a way for the chickens to get away from each other. Um, you hear about pecking orders, and that is true about chickens. Um, 
there's always somebody who just doesn't like somebody else in the flock of chickens. So, giving them visual barriers in the form of vegetation. If um, chickens are kept in high enough densities, they will destroy the vegetation um, and show sometimes um, just to actually creating places and spaces where you could put a, a stack of wood, you could put in the wintertime, um, use Christmas trees in there just to give them a, an ability to hide and, and break that barrier so that the chicken that's currently at the bottom of the pecking order is not getting pecked all the time. The other thing that um, is, is in this picture is that um, Chickens, when you try to introduce a new chicken or young chickens to the rest of the flock, there's always um, a dynamic and change in that pecking order and the chickens don't necessarily like each other. Um, and so this is a concept from zoo medicine where uh, creating a howdy cage, which is basically a little cage within the pen to um, keep those chickens that you're trying to introduce till they become familiar with the environment to the other birds that are around them, get used to seeing them, and and they um, integrate into the flock with a lot less stress and a lot less fighting. Um, the largest, my, my um, largest problem we have with some of these flocks where they're getting, they're not necessarily getting rid of all their hens at the um, in the fall when their new new pullets are starting to lay eggs is um, if they want to keep up some of their hens over is integrating the new pullets in to these older flocks and um, it really negatively impacts egg production when you try to throw all these young young ladies in with all these older girls and they just uh, there's fights and there's eggs that get broken and, and so uh, for some of the smaller producers that are producing eggs and have customers who are relying on them for eggs on a regular basis um, um, having a more gentle way to approach the integration is a, a good a good thing to do so the other components of um, of welfare are, are maintenance, maintenance of health, and so uh, I think I'll walk you through a couple things as far as disease prevention and then uh, management of sick birds, just so that you'll be a little bit more comfortable seeing these birds. Um, our biggest goal, obviously, is to do no harm, and um, if you're comfortable in, in handling them and in protecting your your patient as well as yourself, I think that will go a long way. So. Uh, chicken, so where do chickens come from? Um, again, a lot of people are purchasing chicks on a whim or they have a, uh, an idea that they want to get these chickens and so they go to a, um, a feed mill or they order them through a catalog and those chicks are, are shipped through the, the mail at one day of age. Um, there's a lot of potential problems and risks with um, introducing these birds and getting them and back in the 1930s a lot of the commercial uh, poultry industry was negatively impacted by the flora, which is the salmonella, uh, and so they developed the National Poultry Improvement Plan. Uh, basically, uh, members strive to reduce the transmission and the risk of disease in these birds, and it's um, been a very positive uh, impact on, on not only commercial production, but the advantage to um, people who want a few birds around their house is that they, they can actually start out and start with healthier birds to begin with. Uh, that said, um, a lot of people find birds either through other sources, people are, um, there's, there's a large um, um, second of the population of, of poultry raisers that show their birds, they also go to auctions and they're buying and selling birds and so there's a lot of birds that are coming in and out and the biggest source of of illness is clearly introduction of, of disease with the rest of your birds. So um, I have some clients that actually um, institute quarantine programs where they actually will quarantine any new bird that's coming into their flock uh, with um, pro prophylactic treatment destined to actually or determined to be the, um, whatever that, that producer wants to do and to what level. Um, some of them want to do some routine screening, especially if they've had illnesses in the past um, that they want to keep out. Um, and then there are other clients who, um, in my opinion, do the best job, and that is the closed flock management, where you never ever uh, bring, and no birds leave, um, and no birds come in um, as, as part, of their, part of their program. Um, the exception being that they will get day, day one chicks from um, participants in the National Poultry Improvement Plan flocks so that um, those birds are pretty much clean and free of disease at the time that they're coming in. To, their, to join the flock, but um, if those birds go out, if they show those birds, they will sell them. They um, uh, a lot of times we're very, very careful about 
um, not introducing disease. And especially once they had problems, it's um, that much harder to eliminate those diseases. So additional things are how do you make these birds happy? Um, you know, you've got a little chicken, she's in her coop, she's in a pen. Uh, they tend to pick anything green or eat anything that is, is potentially interesting. And so very soon they have um, a dirt pen with a, a little coop and all of they have all their food and water needs met and their basic things to keep them alive. Uh, they, they certainly develop some behavioral problems and, and some things that are an issue as far as uh, that. So we can find that ways to mentally stimulate these flocks of you know, backyard birds. Uh, and foraging is one of the biggest ones. Uh, there are foraging balls that you can buy specifically for your chickens that hide high food trees in. But um, even things like, you know, buying, buying a loaf or uh, a head of lettuce, throwing that into the flock, uh, putting things that are novel, moving around their food dishes, uh, making it so that it's a little bit more difficult for them to find their, find their food and forage a little bit. The other thing are natural behaviors that you want to encourage them to participate or take place in. Uh, the chicken um, naturally likes to um, scratch around in the dirt and dust. It's um, designed to help to reduce um, parasites as well as clean their, clean their feathers. And, and so giving them a dust bath is not a bad way. Um, a lot of the um, uh, um, owners of geese and ducks um, especially like to make sure that their birds have a place to swim. Um, a lot of times they'll use kitty wading pools. They can become a, a, a stewer very quickly. And so telling, you know, teaching your clients how to, to clean those areas and, and while providing environmental enrichment, allow them to have a, a clean and safe environment for their birds to live in. Um, one of the other things that we definitely want to do to try to remove some of these stressors are uh, providing appropriate stocking numbers. Uh, you know, chickens tend to reproduce, they can get more and more birds. Uh, they often tend to, again, in the wintertime, um, be confined to smaller houses, and if you've got too many chickens in one place, they're gonna start uh, picking at each other, you're gonna get have um, feather picking behaviors, you're gonna have aggression of, of chickens just between the individual number of birds. The other thing is that um, when owners are purchasing baby chicks, um, they can buy chicks one of two ways. They can buy um, straight run chicks, which are um, an appropriate or an equal ratio of male and female chickens, or they can buy sex chicks, which occasionally uh, a male rooster will get through on uh, when they are sexing those chicks at, at birth, and so you'll get additional or more roosters than what you should have or want to have, and that is definitely stressful on the hens, it's stressful between the roosters, and, um, and you can get a lot more aggression and issues of, of just flock unrest. Um, and the final thing is, you know, finding ways to reduce threats from predators. Uh, you know, chickens, again, get eaten by anything that can try to get a delicious chicken dinner. And so giving them shelter, giving them places to hide, giving them, especially if they're free roaming and, and having an ability to, you know, get out and, and enjoy the environment. And that's a lot of the reasons why people want to have a chicken or two is to have a run around their garden, find ways that they can, they can protect themselves. So, um, you have someone calls you up, they have a chicken, they, or a duck, or a goose, or a turkey, and they um, want your assistance in its health, um, in its health care. Uh, how do you encourage them to bring those chickens in? Uh, and uh, there are clearly multiple ways to get your chicken to, to, the, to your hospital or um, and one of the, the things that you certainly want to be careful of, or your goal would be obviously reduce the risk of injury, further injury to the patient that's ill already, um, as well as um, finding ways to reduce stress to the patient if they're already compromised and ill. You certainly don't want to um, comp compromise them any further. So, um, you know, there again, if you are a pet chicken keeper and can make a little um, chicken chicken transporter, um, that's certainly a, an option that is available. Um, you know, the bigger question is, how are you going to catch these chickens? And um, they're often in, in free range situations, or they're um, on pasture and pens. And um, I will tell you that it's not easy to catch a chicken who doesn't want to be caught. Um, and so, one of the things that I do is most of the, most of the chickens that are on free range or in shelters are um, in pasture um, have a shelter at night. And so, um, I've begun 
getting people to train their birds to actually come in for treats into their shelter so that you can actually habituate them to being in that area when you're there. And so just by finding treats that the chickens are particularly like, and, and I mean, just all of us as pet owners like to give our pets treats. So um, you can give, give them mealworms, you can give them special food. Um, and just training um, that flock of chickens to readily run in and come into that shelter uh, so that if you ever do have to capture or catch them, they're, they're already habituated to coming in there so you can close a shelter and, and catch them. So uh, if not, I've seen people run around with fishing nets. Uh, there's this little chicken leg hook thing that people have that can snag a chicken on the run. Um, there are some people um, that are quite good at it. When I was younger and um, in, middle, in my 4-H program, I was pretty good with a little chicken leg catcher. But, um, that's, I, I've lost that skill. Uh, so, this, chick, these, this chicken or turkey comes in. Uh, you know, it's extremely important, especially if you're able to figure out what's going on with them. And flock history is really, really important. Uh, most of these birds that are in um, aren't coming from close flocks. They aren't coming from um, birds that have a particularly good quarantine program. And so a lot of these um, chickens and, and birds are transported in and out, they go to a lot of different places, uh, and then they're dumped right back into the flocks. Um, they're commingled at shows, they're commingled at fairs, and, uh, and at sales, and so there's a lot of rampant viral, bacterial, and parasitic disease that come with that. Uh, the other thing is that, um, unfortunately, chickens uh, don't have a lot of economic value um, in, as individuals. Um, now, there are people who raise very high-end show chickens that are worth hundreds of dollars a piece, and they do tend to be willing to spend a little bit more money, but um, people often try to treat their chickens at home um, with multiple methods based on not so scientific and sometimes some good medicine uh, to um, before they seek your opinion, and if they fail, uh, you kind of need to know what you're dealing with and what those chickens have been exposed to and what drugs have been used and what hasn't worked so far before you um, um, Get, get involved with trying to help them because you're already two steps behind if they've dumped every single drug in the world in front of these birds. Um, so the, the first thing I would say is making sure that you have some, uh, some skills or at least the uh, ability to handle your patients safely. So bringing them in, um, getting them removed from whatever container they're in, and safely handling them is really important. Uh, I was lucky enough when I worked in Jackson to have a staff that was very, very interested in birds and very, very um, um, capable of, of handling birds and, and allowing me to do my job as an exam, doing my exam and diagnostics without having to worry about both handling and examining at the same time. Um, it, is, it is a skill that just comes with doing it and being confident. Um, Again, use things like towels, use things like covering their heads. Most chickens, and especially some of the bigger waterfowl, uh, you cover up their eyes and they tend to relax a little bit. Uh, the, um, the other thing is knowing how to catch these animals without injuring them. And like chickens and turkeys are, are pretty much terrestrial, they're very good at running around, and so they have pretty strong legs. Uh, so we can readily handle them and hold them and restrain them by their legs. Uh, with things like ducks, uh, their legs are much more delicate. You certainly don't ever want to grab a duck by, by the leg. You're more likely to fracture their, um, their legs and cause more injury. Uh, the nice thing about ducks and geese is they have pretty strong necks and you can readily grab them and, and then uh, restrain their wings. And if you can get a towel around them and wrap, hold their wings against their body and hold their head, uh, you're much further ahead. Uh, I will tell you, restraining the head of a goose is extremely important because these can deliver some pretty nasty bites. Um, I'll show you in a minute their lamella, which is um, is their um, modification on their beaks that allow them to prehend and get food. And um, they are um, extremely uncomfortable when they grab you and get you. Uh, the other thing is human safety. Uh, one, physical injury to staff. Uh, you certainly can get bit, um, scratched, kicked, pecked, um, lots of things. Um, additionally, there are a fair number of zoonotic diseases that your staff and your clients can be exposed to. And being cautious and careful um, in making sure that you reduce that risk is, is extremely important. 
So let's talk about our basic poultry patients so that we're all much more familiar with what's going on inside, inside these birds um, so that you can help to determine what's normal, what's abnormal, as well as uh, feel a little bit more comfortable about the difference in the anatomy between these birds and our, our normal mammal patients. Uh, so, a basic review of avian anatomy. Um, they, uh, they are bipedal, uh, they have wings, they have feathers, they have beaks. Uh, other differences on internally is that they do have pneumatic bones, uh, they breathe through air sacs that are actually connected to their lungs, so they have no diaphragm. Uh, um, and so, um, that is an important difference that we need to know, especially when dealing with respiratory disease. And they lay eggs. And um, one of the um, facts that you might want to share with your family is that um, if you want to bet somebody which which um, um, how the, the chickens' ovaries actually produce the egg that's on their table, is that um, the um, uh, except for extremely rare cases, all chickens have a functional um, left ovary, and that the right ovary is non-functional. Um, and that is a modification of them being birds, reducing weight, and and, uh, and it's much easier to have a, a single ovary in, in um, if, you're, if you're a bird. Uh, the other thing is about feathers. Um, so people get caught up and worried about um, bird feathers and blood feathers, and they've heard about blood feathers, and clients always want to know or see a blood feather because they're very nervous about them. Um, so bird, birds have hair-like feathers. Um, birds are covered with feathers, obviously. Um, they have hair-like feathers, including their um, eyelashes. They are not true hair. They are actually modified feathers. Um, just so you know, and you can assure your clients, mature feathers have no nerve or blood supply to them. So we do occasionally have clients who have um, birds that are escaping from their pen. We talk about trimming their wings, and they're nervous about trimming uh, feathers up on their wings. Um, but a mature feather uh, has neither a nerve or a blood supply that you have to worry about causing injury or, or discomfort. Uh, but they also uh, do have a very rich blood supply on, on their own, on an actively growing feather. Um, and people are extremely paranoid about uh, break, uh, breaking a blood feather, cutting a blood feather. Uh, they, there are many stories about birds who have died from, from hemorrhage associated with a broken blood feather. Uh, in the 30 years I've been, almost 30 years I've been practicing and seeing birds, um, I've never seen a mortality associated with a fractured blood feather. Uh, if people uh, allow the bird to calm down and relax, typically the bleeding stops, and, um, and I, I can attribute a mortality um, case to uh, a broken blood feather. So if that reassures you um, that you're not going to kill these birds by seeing them, um, I hope that helps. Uh, the other thing is that feathers grow on tracks on the skin surface, so when you pull that turkey out um, before you throw it in the oven, look at the little little feather follicles that are covering your body. They're not generally distributed all over. They're not in, in, they're in tracks on your body. Um, and that is clearly most obvious when there's no feathers on the bird, uh, but even when they're moistened with water or oil, they get oily. Um, they actually have um, um, a good coverage, and they've, they've been, I mean, they've evolved to, to cover cover their body surface. Um, on chickens in general, and, and poultry as well, females, um, they have no feather tracks or turlet on their um, ventral chest, and that is allowing them to brood their eggs. Um, they have better contact there. Um, so it's, um, it's sometimes distressing to owners to um, have either a bird that gets injured or gets damp and wet, and they see these big areas of baldness on their birds. They immediately, you know, look through their their books or jump on the internet and really think that their their chicken has lice or mites or something terrible. Um, and a lot of times, it is literally just something that is a normal part of their anatomy. Uh, so, how do these birds differ from from uh, normal mammals? So, some of the unique anatomical features are. Uh, um, chickens have a comb. Um, chickens' combs can range anywhere from, this is a single comb, um, they can have P-shaped combs, they can have rose combs, they can have a cushion comb. Uh, they also, chickens have waddles, the little appendages that dangle below their beak. Uh, and their ear lobe is, is located directly below their ear in this location here. Uh, you'll also see breeders um, of some show birds that 
Um, the breed standard requires that birds be dubbed. And so dubbing is a term that someone may ask you about or you may hear. Um, and dubbing is the removal of the comb, the waddle, and the earlobes on a, on a young male chicken uh, to actually alter his appearance so that he looks, looks like the breed standard. Uh, it is kind of the equivalent of an ear crop. Uh, it is neither necessary or essential. Um, it clearly is painful. Uh, there are multiple references of advocating for uh, um, doing it on a cold fall day so that they don't bleed so actively. Uh, I have actually talked a couple of uh, my reader friends into actually administering meloxicam prior to it because they weren't before. They administered no, no pain, pain control. Um, and uh, we called it, got a dosage and cleared it um, um, and documented that these birds all had had meloxicam administered. And, um, and I think it probably is um, much more humane for the chicken. Um, our turkeys um, also have their own little set of, of um, genetic, or I'm sorry, you know, uh, mod modifications associated with their bodies. Um, the snood is the, um, the long appendage that hangs from a, a male turkey. Female turkeys have them as well. Um, the snood is, is, is quite um, responsive to um, the turkey's mood, and it will be small, it will be long. Um, when it's displaying, it certainly is, is um, um, quite, quite extensive and, and quite obvious. Um, do, the dewlap is the um, layer of tissue between the bird's beak and his, his chin. Um, caramels, um, sometimes owners, but especially if they have, are first-time turkey producers, their young male turkeys will develop these little red knots all over the top of their head. They think that their bird has pox. Um, and um, they are just, again, another modification that makes um, these tom turkeys more, more attractive to the female. Um, additionally, male turkeys develop a beard. The beard is located in the center of his chest. Uh, turkeys' beards are, again, an ornamental modification. Um, the beard grows as the turkey grows. This is clearly a relatively young male turkey, so he's less than a year old and he has a rel relatively small beard. Um, chickens and turkeys and pheasants um, all have spurs, um, especially the males. They're much more um, uh, pronounced and can get quite long. Um, they do have a rich blood supply and nerve. We have, I've had clients ask about trimming their bird's spurs or removing their spurs. Uh, they can be rounded and shortened, but um, if you go too deep, they uh, are, it's quite painful, they'll bleed, uh, and they certainly have some discomfort associated with it. Uh, they do grow back, uh, so I, I'm not a big advocate of, of of removal, they certainly can trim them to reduce their sharpness. Uh, this is the lamella that we were talking about, I alluded to earlier. Um, geese have um, some modifications of their beak. The lamella help them to actually prehend their food and get picked up. There are the little ridges on the upper and lower surface of the, um, the white goose's beak. Um, they are very good at allowing them to grip things, and if your finger is in there, they will hold on to their, their finger quite well, and it's quite painful. The um, tip of their beak has a, a modification called a nail that's also a sensory device to allow them to um, pick up things, and they have a, it has a rich um, nerve supply. Um, and then some species of yeast will develop a knob on, the, um, on their forehead. Um, it's usually more prominent in males than females. Uh, the, the China goose, um, as well as the African goose, both have, have or breeds that have domestic breeds that have a knob. Um, and then the European gland. So birds have a preen gland, um, which is located at the base of their tail. It is a modified sebaceous gland that produces an oily substance that they can um, um, use to, um, they use it to smooth their feathers, they use it in grooming. Uh, it is um, typically removed when, when birds are slaughtered, so you don't see it on a chicken that's, um, that's you're going to throw in the oven, but if you look closely, you'll see where it was. Um, it sits right on the, um, on the base of the tail, uh, right before the base of the tail, and um, it is it is an um, important part of grooming behavior in, in chickens um, and, and turkeys. Uh, then, the digestive tract of birds is certainly modified and different from that of, of your mammalian patients. Uh, and they have a few unique anatomical features. Uh, 
So starting at the heading, um, in the roof of the uh, mouth of birds, they have a coena, and the coena is a, um, a, the connection between the respiratory tract and, and the uh, oral cavity. Uh, it's a great site for obtaining respiratory samples from the upper respiratory tract. Uh, birds have a crop. Uh, a crop is a modified outpouching of the esophagus that allows them to store food. Uh, birds are opportunistic feeders and eaters, so they will try to fill up their crop when they have food sources available. Um, that food is then uh, moistened and, and prepared to move down into the ventricular, or the proventriculus and the ventriculus. Uh, the proventriculus is the glandular part of a bird's of digestive tract, similar to our stomach, it secretes gastric acid and um, starts to break down uh, proteins and the constituents of their diet, where it then enters the bird's gizzard uh, or ventriculus. The ventriculus is the grinding part of the um, digestive tract. We often um, um, find that birds um, ingest, especially if they're free range birds, ingest stones and, and, and materials that. Um, which sits in the ventriculus to help to grind and digest their food. Um, from there, we can, some, we can see um, Beckel's diverticulum, and Beckel's diverticulum is in uh, the combination of where the um, jejunum and the ilium meet in the stomach. It's also the site of where the yolk sat from a bird when it, prior to um, um, hatching, the yolk, which is outside the bird's body, is, is brought into the abdominal cavity and closed. Um, Meckel's diverticulum is the site where they, um, the former yolk sac was attached. Uh, birds and poultry in general have a, um, two cica that are at the um, division of their small intestine from their large intestine. Um, those cecal pouches play a role in digestion. There are also certain parasites that can be found. Um, there are also um, um, lymphatic tissue within the cica that are, are part of the um, bird's um, um, ability to control infectious disease and to help to with, with um, preventing illness. Um, finally, the large intestine empties into the cloaca, which is a common reproductive opening for both the reproductive tract and the urinary tract. Oh my god, really? Okay, sorry. Let's get through these. Uh, so, um, as far, so all these notes are actually in the um, um, electronic handout or electronic material that I provided. So, you can get those. Um, two important things as far as infectious disease um, that you should be aware of. They're both reportable. They're both potential problems, maybe influenza and paramyxovirus. Uh, so, and, and basically all infectious diseases in, in birds and poultry look the same. So, uh, bottom line is if you are faced with extensive morbidity and mortality, you should certainly submit samples and, and consider reporting it. Um, this is a re reportable list of birds um, of poultry specific diseases or birds in general. Um, as you can see, a fair number of them are zoonotic, so you need to protect yourself, your staff, and your clients. Um, there are multiple vaccines available for um, against infectious disease. Um, for backyard poultry owners, I certainly um, um, recommend Merrick's disease. Merrick's disease is administered at the time that the chicks are hatched. They come from the hatchery of Merrick's vaccinated. Um, well, um, Merrick's disease is, is actually a herpes virus that actually will cause um, neoplasia and as well as um, um, problems with um, orthopedic issues and, and neurologic disease in, in birds. Uh, poultry patients also get a fair number of intestinal parasites. I'm not a huge advocate of deworming birds unless they are unthrifty as a result of it. Most people um, are, are distressed by the fact that they have a large number of if their birds pass a worm, but most of them are harmonious and commensal and don't really cause a lot of problems. The one species um, that is a problem is um, the sequel worm, which is um, can carry histomonas. Histomonas causes blackhead in turkeys, and so there's a, a, a general rule that you should raise turkeys and chicks together. Um, histomonas can also come from um, infected birds directly, as well as earthworms can be a source of it, so um, you can still have problems even though you're being careful and not um, introducing your chickens and your um, turkeys. Uh, ectoparasites, there's a number of, um, of parasites that birds will get, um, especially um, like, like, like scaly like mites and, and lice. Um, there are very good uh, available um, insecticides that work really well in, in clearing these, especially environmental, and there's some of their actually approved for use directly on the birds. Uh, as far as poultry patient, the traumatic injuries, we see a lot of, of flock mating and, and predator injuries. 
Um, the one thing I will tell you is that we always tend to reach for antibiotics um, for predator infected injuries, and to be honest with you, it's going to negatively impact your ability to um, you keep eggs and use those eggs because of withdrawal times. And, and I've had very good luck just keeping the wounds moist and clean, and um, and not having to necessarily use um, anything other than an anti-inflammatory um, to proper care of these birds and, um, and kind of avoid it um, systemic antibiotics. Um, a big thing with, with especially pet egg layers is reproductive accidents. Um, the biggest thing I would say is if you're managing them, reduction in photo period is essential. Um, birds are, are um, stimulated by egg, for egg production by photo period, and so if you've got a bird who does have a reproductive accident, you're trying to manage that, um, really reduce her, her um, life period. Um, we can go through some more in infectious diseases. Um, the one thing I really want to um, impress on you is, is as far as veterinarians, um, we need to be sensitive to the death of our patients. Um, and, and so my, my thoughts are euthanasia is one of the things that you often get called for as as the only time when you're going to interact with some of these pet um, chicken or pet turkey patients because they have gotten to the point where they're actively dying or the owner has concerns about their quality of life and you have um, an ability to make an impression and actually interact with them and maybe that's the window of opportunity for you to help them with caring for their healthy birds. Um, there are terrible ways to kill birds that are approved. Uh, you know, um, stunning uh, with cervical dislocation. Um, male baby chicks that are deemed male at, at the hatcheries can be killed by maceration, which is basically throwing them into a machine that is full of knives and it literally just destroys them instantly. Um, that's not the thing that you want to impress upon your clients. Um, and as, as veterinarians advocating for proper welfare, we really need to make sure that we provide a stress-free and a, a painless death. Lots of ways to do that. But um, I, um, one of the ways that I've um, seen, especially with um, patients at, at, at house calls with chickens, is um, that you can actually administer euthasol orally or through divagion to their um, GI tract. In about 20 minutes, they'll be anesthetized beyond the point that you can't stimulate them. And at that point, you can easily access a wean vein or um, in, in situations where you can't find a, a wean vein, um, you can, you can administer um, um, intracelomic or intrahepatic or intracardiac injection of glucosol to actually um, um, provide a safe and, and painless death for them. So there it is. Um, my conclusion, um, these are actually some of my chickens. Um, I am passionate about chickens as well as, um, as turkeys and I will follow up with um, the resources. This, this is a uh, an accumulation, I think that's available to you guys as attendees. And finally, I want to see if this will work. These are my turkeys. I, um, I thought for Thanksgiving, it would be a good thing to show you a video of my turkeys. And, um, oh. it's working on here, but it's not wrong on there. Uh, but, um, the one thing I have found is that um, I would have a really hard time eating turkey. This year I'm not eating turkey. Um, well, I am eating turkey because the, the one turkey that we were eating was um, resulted in an accidental death. But um, I have really found that these guys are the best companions for hikes in the woods. They want to follow you everywhere you go. Um, where, I, where I live in um, southwest Michigan, uh, it's, it's beautiful to hike out in the fall and walk through the woods and the turkeys just want to be with you and they hang out with you and I have friends come over and the first thing the turkeys do are, you know, walk, um, try to jump up onto their car and interact with people because they are um, loaded with personality and really fun. So, um, sorry I went long. Um, we have if, questions. if there's questions, I'd be happy to entertain questions about that. Is there any historical connection between those practices? 
Yes, um, this, the breeds that are typically dubbed um, and required for show requirements are breeds that were uh, originally used for cockfighting, so Old English Canes and modern day Bantams and Standard Chickens are the ones that require for a, uh, any chicken or any male chicken over a year old, so any roosters have to be dubbed to be shown. Uh, they can show um, cockerels in the um, cockerel class um, undubbed, but the um, mature ones have to be dubbed for sure. Another question over here somewhere? Can you talk about the welfare of uh, inside chickens versus brain chickens? Are they at, do they benefit from being outside in the way that wasps does the increased risk of parasites and trauma? Um, yeah, well, I, I can breathe, sure. Um, <laughs> so there is an inherent risk of letting anything free range uh, because predators like to eat them. Um, I'm kind of uh, mixed in that I think that the birds are most vulnerable during the night uh, when predators are more prevalent and more likely. So um, allowing them to range during the day um, is, a, is a kind of a safer way to do that, although hawks try to get my chickens all the time. Um, Yes, you can, again, my thoughts are that I'm always trying to keep my birds from killing themselves or something from killing them. Um, and it's, it's a, a constant battle and a constant challenge. Um, I have them because I like them to um, be part of my life and I don't want to spend all my time inside. So they get to run around outside and it gives me pleasure to see them outside. Um, yes, if you're, if you're the type of person who can't afford and emotionally would be damage like a predator or having something physically happen to them, then you can keep them inside, but I think that at that point you need to meet all their nutritional, emotional, behavioral needs because my chickens love to scratch in the dirt, they love to take dust baths, they love to find a worm, and you know, and, and, and the roosters are always happy to call a hen over when they found something delicious. And it's, it's fun, I mean, those natural behaviors are, are allowed to occur because they are outside running. It's the trade-offs yeah. you have to balance for yourself, yep. yeah, for your birds. And, and a lot of those valuable chickens that are shown are kept caged. Um, they never are seen outside, um, and they, um, you know, they're they're beautiful to look at, but they are a collection of, you know, porcelain dolls that are on somebody's shelf because they, they just don't don't do anything other than. And what is the So Chris asked about the um, expected life, the life expectancy of a bird that has outside access versus inside. So I mean, as you can see from those pictures, that small coop with a little one little pen is is in my house. Um, those chicken, I mean, I am all about security, so there's everything I can do around them to keep them in. So they're completely safe, uh, or as safe as I can make them. Um, and so their lifespan is going to be probably 10 times what a free range chicken is uh, because something will eat them where I live. You know, if they are not protected, um, especially at night, but during the day, the, I mean, I have Cooper's hawks sitting on top of my chicken. Um, so, yeah, they, their, their life span is dramatic. In, in my mind, though, it makes me happy to see them running around. Uh, and it is, I feel bad when one of them is killed, uh, but I also know that those predators need to eat. And my birds are not native, they are not natural. The turkeys are, I have native turkeys that are on my farm, but they are they don't look like that. And, um, and they're probably a lot smarter than my turkeys, because they don't want to make them. Anyone else with a question? Yeah. I know very little about chickens, but I had an egg question last week, and that is, why are brown eggs brown on the outside and white on the inside? Um, it has to do with how those eggs are produced, and the eggs are produced. So, in the reproductive tract, um, the uterus is actually the shell line that actually produces the, the outer shell on your um, egg, and, and that has pigment in it. Uh, and so, when the, when the egg is 
is laid down, there's actually a membrane that is actually produced as it's moving down the reproductive tract, and that initial membrane is on the interior of the egg, it gives it the white appearance. The shell is actually produced by the shell gland, and, and that is the pigment. All right. I I often have people call me with locomotor problems. They bought meat strains of chickens or turkeys, then fell in love with them and couldn't eat them, and kept them way longer than what their life expectancy should have been, and they developed problems with their feet and their legs. And it's really hard to discuss that with them because it's a terminal condition. And, really. Right. And, and there was, I skipped through that segment, but in Chicago, where I am, there are a fair number of very small uh, meat markets and slaughterhouses that will get live, live birds in, and they will slaughter them on site and sell them. Um, and occasionally, one of those chickens will escape during the process of transferring them from the trucks that they come into the city on, and so someone will find a chicken and fall in love with it because they've been keeping it, and she gets bigger and bigger, or he gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and to the point that they orthopedically are a disaster, or they have a cardiac event because they are so fat, and, um, and people are heartbroken because either their chicken is, is terminally ill or damaged to the point that it can't live a life. And, and having that conversation with them is, as a veterinarian, one of those things where we, we you have to be very gentle with allowing them to realize that the chickens that they're buying in the store are this same kind of chicken and that they wouldn't live uh, very long if we didn't tell them. And now, and, and that's all the part is the turkey. Yeah. So it's a big turkey that has to suffer for years. Right. So I can hold at a sanctuary. That's, that, that's how you justify eating your Thanksgiving turkey. Thank <laughs> you.